This is going to be Matthew chapter 1. I want to try something a little bit different here and give you guys a visual as we go through the through the chapter. I'm here on the website hensleybiblebeliever.com so if you want to come there and get the outline and be able to read it yourself. But let's just get right into it and look at Matthew chapter 1 and this is going to be about why Jesus is my king. Why Jesus is my king. And the first reason is because of these magnified words in his book. These magnified words. In Matthew 1, 1 it says, The book of the generation of Jesus Christ. God gave you a book. It's a precious book. God gave us r words written in books God thought enough of you to leave you with words in Isaiah 35 16 it says seek ye out the book of the Lord and read God is a book man and he's the only author that's available 24 hours a day and seven days a week for questions for you to ask him questions about his book do you realize that the God of the universe the one who wrote the Bible the one that was back there with Adam, Noah, and Moses is available 24-7 for you to ask him questions about the book. Not only that, but he has all the answers. He is the only one worthy to open the sealed book in Revelation 5. When you go over there in Revelation 5 and no man's worthy to open the book, the Lord was the only one worthy. There's nothing sealed that he can't reveal. He's the only one who can open your understanding to this book. He thinks so much of his book that he places it above his name. In Psalm 138 and verse 2, it says, I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth, for thou hast magnified thy words above all thy name. How are you doing with the book? Are you opening the book? When you open the book, does it got a bunch of dust flying everywhere? Do you think it's just some book that you lay on your great-grandmother's bookshelf and you never open up? It's magnified words in his book. We know Jesus Christ is king because of the sure words that he laid out in his book. The book here in Matthew 1.1, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, that's... That's the Gospel of Matthew, but I'm also referring to all 66 books. And if you're going to know Jesus Christ, then you're going to have to, as they say, hit the books. So, the judgment seat of Christ is like your final exam. Have you studied to show yourself approved unto God? Have you done that? Are you going to be approved when you get to that final exam. The king thought enough of you to leave you with 66 books to prepare. It is his history book. Notice that history. It's his story. It's his story. Some people call it a hymn book because it's all about him. One of his favorite sayings that he said to people many times, especially the people who claimed to be the most religious, was, Have ye not read? He's my king because of the words that he left me in a book. And these words were picked out of billions of other words. And when you realize this, you won't just do a obligated reading of the Bible every year, seeing how many times you can read it through. You'll really start looking at every single word. Because out of everything that Jesus did, the words in the King James Bible is what was chosen to be wrote down and preserved. Out of all the things that could be written, out of all the things that were written, these words in these 66 books are what was chosen, handpicked by the Lord, to be preserved and handed down to you today. This shows that it's about every single word. And since Jesus knew he was king, he probably wrote himself a copy in a book. Deuteronomy seventeen eighteen, And it shall be when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book. 
out of that which is before the priests, the Levites. So, the king was supposed to write his own copy. And Jesus knew the book more than anybody. I guarantee you, he wrote his own copy. If it wasn't for his book, I wouldn't know he's king. And for this reason, we can also magnify the words. So Matthew 1, 1, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ. Now, comp compare that phrase, the book of the generation. Compare this with Genesis 5, where it gives you the book of the generation of Adam. And you'll find that it says the phrase, and he died. If you go back in Genesis 5, you'll see it says, after all the men it gives, it says, and he died. And he died over and over again. That's what it says in the book of the generation of Adam. But in the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, it doesn't use the words death or died. It uses the word beget. Because Jesus Christ brings life. He is the author of life. Adam only brought death. So in the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the key phrase is beget. This book that you're reading, when you open it, when you open it and you read it, it's like breathing life into you. And all the books in the in the world couldn't it couldn't compare to how many books could have been written. I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. All the books in the world couldn't compare. Jesus Christ brings life. Adam brought death. When God formed Adam out of the dust of the ground, let sometime shortly after that, Adam brought death. It says in 1 Corinthians 15, 22, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. 1 Corinthians 15, 45, And so it is written, The first man, Adam, was made a living soul, the last man, the last Adam, was made a quickening spirit. That's Jesus. Jesus is the last Adam. The first Adam brought death. The second, the last Adam, makes you alive. Romans 5.12, Wherefore, as by one man, which was Adam, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Adam brings death. Romans 5.14, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who was the figure of him that was to come. So death reigned from Adam to Moses. Adam brought sin. Romans 5.15, But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. So through one man, many are dead. Through another man, many are made alive. The first Adam brought death. The last Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ, brings life. He is my king because his book makes it plain who he is. You open the book, get rid of that dust, start reading it, studying it. The book makes it plain. The next thing is, Matthew's genealogy proves it. It proves he's king. Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Obviously, David is the great, 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 great grandfather of the man Christ Jesus. So you can use the word son... For a grandson, for a son-in-law, or even an adopted son. In the flesh, in the flesh, he is the son of David. In the spirit, he's David's Lord. And the genealogy proves Jesus is king. Now, I found this uh, family line here of Jesus here. You got the line that you see in the book of Luke. It goes through the line of Mary, 
looking back at the the uh the lineage of Mary, and then in Matthew you got the the lineage of Joseph tracing you all the way back. And in Luke it goes all the way back. It'll go all the way back to Adam. And in Matthew it goes all the way back to Abraham. And see how you can trace all the way through the Bible, Adam, Seth, Enos, Canaan. You can trace it all the way back to Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ's line. And there's plenty of these you can look up on Google that will just lay it out for you. Type in Jesus family tree or something like that. And it's just amazing that you can trace the Lord Jesus Christ all the way back to Adam. In the flesh, he's the son of David. In the spirit, he's David's Lord. Matthew twenty two forty two, saying, What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? They say unto him, The son of David. He saith unto them, How then doth David in spirit call him Lord? To see, you see, to manifest, for God to manifest himself in the flesh, he was made of the seed of David. But Jesus Christ was here way before he manifested himself in the flesh. But you know David, the one that killed Goliath, killed the giant, the man after God's own heart. When it comes to the flesh, Jesus was made of the seed of David. In Romans 1, 3, it says, Concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. He's not his son in the spirit. Because look what it says, but he declared to be the son of God. And by calling him the son of God, you make him equal with God. In Romans 9, 4 and 5, it says, Who are Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises, whose are the fathers and of whom concerning the flesh... Concerning the flesh, Christ came through these Israelites, the fathers. He came through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. David was promised that his throne would be forever. This is because Jesus Christ would be in the line of David. It says in Second Samuel concerning David in Second Samuel seven sixteen, in thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. Psalm one thirty two eleven. The Lord hath sworn in truth unto David; he will not turn from it. Of the fruit of thy body will I set up, set upon thy throne. If thy children will keep my covenant and my testimony that I teach them, their children shall also sit upon thy throne forevermore. It's a, it's a throne that never stops. It keeps going. That's because Jesus Christ is going to sit on that throne. In Jeremiah 23, 5, it says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. And notice this, a king shall reign and prosper and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. A king shall capital K, shall reign and prosper. And in his days, Judah shall be saved. And Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name whereby he shall be called the Lord, our righteousness. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. Jeremiah thirty-three fifteen. in those days. Watch out for that phrase, in those days. And at that time will I cause the branch of righteousness capital B, the branch, that's the Lord Jesus, to grow up unto David, and he shall execute judgment and righteousness in the land. It's going to be so much better then than it is now with Joe Biden, Kamala Harris. It's going to be so much better. You're not going to have to worry about complete morons running things. The Lord is going to execute judgment and righteousness in the land. And you know what he's going to go by? The book. The book we just talked about. In those days shall Judah be saved and Jerusalem shall dwell safely. Imagine that. Imagine never having to worry about anything. And this is the name wherewith she shall be called the Lord our righteousness. 
Luke one thirty one. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. That's the branch. That's the Lord our righteousness. That's the king that shall reign and prosper. Whose throne's going to go forevermore. It says in Luke one thirty two, He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. How do we know Jesus is king? Jesus is king and Matthew's genealogy proves it. That's how we know. Matthew one one. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David. He's my king, he's the son of David, but also he's the son of Abraham. Jesus Christ is the promised seed of Genesis 3.15. Jesus Christ is the seed of Abraham. You see, Matthew traces his lineage through his adoptive father, Joseph, and he does it all the way back to Abraham. Luke trace if you go to the Gospel of Luke, it traces it through Mary. Not only back to Abraham, but also to Adam. See Luke 3, 23 through 38, if you want to read that real quick. But he, you see, Jesus is the only person that can trace himself all the way back to Adam. He wouldn't need to go to Ancestry.com or one of these websites to give his DNA to trace his lineage all the way back. Or to give some information to trace his lineage all the way back. He's already got it. He can trace it all the way back to Adam. Jesus Christ is in the right line, however you want to look at it. You look at Joseph, his adoptive father, not his real father, but he's in the right line through that way. You look at Mary, where did she come from? He's in the right line through that way. He's the only man qualified to be king. Nobody else could qualify. And on top of that, he's overqualified. He's the only person that could do it, that could be my king. It says in Galatians 3.16, Out of Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not unto seeds as of many, but as of one, unto thy seed, which is Christ. Jesus Christ is the seed of Abraham. Remember back there, God told Abraham, he said, Look, look at the stars, tell the stars if thou be able to number them. He said unto him, So shall thy seed be. Jesus Christ is the is that is the seed. It went through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob had the twelve son his twelve sons, which became the twelve tribes of Israel. As a son of Abraham, Jesus became heir to a covenant that promised a land grant, a seed, and eternal life by faith. Romans 4.13, for the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to, or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. So Jesus will sit on the physical throne of David. He gets the throne. And he's going to be in, in a literal land that was promised to Abraham. And he will rule with a rod of iron. Revelation 19.15, he will reign as king over the whole world in Jerusalem. And a believing remnant of Israel, not an unbelieving remnant, not a bunch of Christ-rejecting Jews, but a believing remnant of Israel is going to go in, into the kingdom and inherit the land. Millions of saints from the church age who got into the body of Christ by grace through faith will go into that kingdom and reign with him. And we know Jesus is king. We know he's heir and bringer of life because Matthew's genealogy proves it. And in Job 14.4, it says, Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? Not one. You see, the Lord is the only one who can do this. You will see when we go through this genealogy that the Lord's family line is unclean. The men in this line are anything but perfect. It says in Matthew 1, 2, Abraham beget Isaac, and Isaac beget Jacob, and Jacob beget Judas and his brethren. Now Isaac, it means laughter. 
Isaac's name means laughter. You know why? Because Abraham and Sarah both laughed when the Lord told them they would have a child in their old age. She, Jacob's name means supplanter. And remember what a trickster Jacob was? Remember how he he's such a, a supplanter, he grabbed a hold of his twin brother Esau's heel on the way out of the womb just so that he could be born first. He wanted to be born first. But notice Judas. Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Judas. Obviously, this isn't Judas Iscariot. This is Judah. He is one of Jacob's boys. And you see, Jacob, as I said, had 12 sons that made up the 12 tribes. And that is he, that, that is who is referred to when it says, and his brethren, at the end of verse 2. Jacob begat Judas and his brethren, the other, the other boys. You're told back there in Genesis that the king would be of the tribe of Judah. Jesus Christ is of that tribe. Notice in Genesis 49.10, the scepter shall not depart from Judah. So Jesus is the son of David, the son of Abraham. And then he is also of the right tribe. The scepter shall not depart from Judah. Jesus Christ is from the right tribe. And Jacob beget Judas and his brethren. Judas, that's Judah. The scepter, you see... It's a staff that's, that a king has. It's, it's a sign of royal authority. So do you know which tribe Jesus Christ is from? Well, look at Revelation 5.5. 5, and one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book. He's the only one that can open the book for you and to loose the seven seals thereof. Take note. Matthew's genealogy also proves that the Lord will use imperfect people. Doesn't that make you feel a little bit better? When you look at yourself and you see how sorry you are. Matthew 1, 3, And Judas beget Phares and Zerah of Tamar, and Phares beget Ezram, and Ezram beget Aram. The names are spelled different than they are in the Old Testament. And this is because... You see, when you translate from Hebrew into English, you get one spelling. But then when you translate from Greek into English, you'd get another spelling. It, the Old Testament was in Hebrew and translated into English. The New Testament was in Greek and translated into English. So that's why it turns out with different spellings. And you got Judas instead of Judah and things like that. But Judas, Judah, laid with Tamar. And the bad thing is that Judah was her father-in-law, and Tamar was a harlot. You see these people that are in the line? This isn't what you would call a godly line, but who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? Only the Lord. You see, she ended up having children by Judah, and this would be Pharaoh's and Zerah. Zerah. See the story in Genesis 38, 24 through 30. But do you see how the Lord used sinners such as this and they are in the line of Jesus Christ? Don't ever think that God can't use you just because of something that you did in the past. In Matthew 1, 4, it says, And Aram begat Aminadab, and Aminadab begat Naasson, and Naasson begat Salmon, and Salmon begat Booz of Rechab, and Booz begat Obed of Ruth, and Obed begat Jesse. Now, Rechab, you know that person, is Rahab and Joshua six seventeen. She was an Amorite and a harlot. Um, have you been involved in some type of sexual sin? I don't think that God will use you or can forgive you or something. Think again. He used Rahab. Remember, she let down that scarlet thread and was spared. Rahab helped God's people, and her life was spared when she let down a scarlet thread from her window. This scarlet thread pictured the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice that God forgives and uses anybody. You find these other guys that it mentions there in verse 5. You find them back in the book of Ruth, in Ruth 4, 18 through 22. That's where you'll find Booz and Obed of Ruth. But Booz, you see, is Ruth's husband, 
You probably know him as Boaz. And Ruth was a Gentile. She was a Moabite. The Moabites were the enemies of God. They came from that incestuous relationship between Lot and his daughters. The Moab, That's where the Moabites came from. You see, though, Ruth ended up being a friend of God. Once again, the Lord has imperfect people, people with a past in his line. Jesse, that's David's father. Jesse came from Ruth. This means Ruth is the great-grandmother to David the king. You ever feel like, well, look at what I've done. Look at my past. Look at who I've been. There's no way my kids will turn out right. Well, Ruth, she was a Moabite. She ended up having King David. Matthew 1, 6, And Jesse begat David the king. And David the king begat Solomon of her that had been the wife of Urias. You see, Solomon is the son of David and Bathsheba. Bathsheba was the wife of Urias. It doesn't even say her name here. But it, it records this scandal in a way. It doesn't completely name it out because it's the New Testament. And in the New Testament, the Lord doesn't like to record the sins of the people of the Old Testament. Because the New Testament, it's about, it's more about grace. The Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. He was buried and resurrected. The sins are paid for. So he doesn't like to bring up the sins in the New Testament. But remember that David committed adultery with Bathsheba and had Uriah killed in the hottest battle in 2 Samuel eleven fifteen through 17. That's not mentioned here. But as a reminder of the Lord's forgiveness, you have it excluded. But it's still got that little hint there that maybe he's trying to remind you of that smudge on David's record a little bit, just to make you think for a minute. He doesn't record it, but he wants you to think for a minute. Once again, you see that nobody is perfect, and God can use you no matter what you've done. Verse 7, And Solomon beget Reboam, and Reboam beget Abiah, and Abiah beget Asa. Reboam is Rehoboam, and he took the throne after Solomon and ended up being the reason that the kingdom split. Israel split into a northern part and a southern part. Judah, the tribes of Judah and Benjamin went to Rehoboam. And then the other ten tribes went to Jeroboam. Remember what Rehoboam did that caused this. He forsook wise counsel. He didn't listen to the old men. He did what his young peers told him to do instead of listening to the old men. The old men said, make it easier on the people, they'll serve you forever. The young peers said, make it harder on the people. It made the people mad. Most of them went with Jeroboam. Judah and Benjamin went with Rehoboam. Then you got Abiah. And this is Abijah or Abijam as you read about back there in Kings and Second Chronicles 13. He is the one that preached that red-hot sermon back there and got his army all fired up when they were going against Jeroboam. They ended up defeating Jeroboam, and he never fully recovered after that. Asa. Asa is the good king that defeated an army of about one million Ethiopians. I love that story. Back in Second Chronicles 14, 9 through 11, showing you that it doesn't matter about numbers. If, if you got God on your side, then you and God are the majority. Asa's a good king. But at the end of his reign, he got diseased in his feet. And he, instead of seeking the Lord first, he went to the physicians first. And see, being diseased in your feet, that pictures your walk with the Lord. How is your walk with the Lord? Are you diseased in your feet or are you walking in the Spirit? Verse 8, and Asa begat Josaphat, and Josaphat begat Joram, and Joram begat Ozias. The first thing to notice is that the Lord chose to omit three kings in the list. If you go back there and read, you got three kings that are missing between Joram and Ozias. There's three kings missing. You, <coughs> you have Ahaziah in 2 Chronicles 22.2, Joash in 2 Chronicles 24.1, and Amaziah in Second Chronicles 25, 1. These three are missing between these two. But see, jo Josaphat is Jehoshaphat back there. He is the good king of Judah that had a problem with 
compromising. He kept shacking up with Ahab and the kings of Israel, and he joined alliance with them so much that he ends up being called the king of Israel towards the end of his reign in Second Chronicles 21 2. So the Lord probably skipped three generations of kings because of the compromise and the intermarriage into Ahab and Jezebel's family by Jehoshaphat and Jehoram. And that Joram is Jehoram. He is the one that hooked up with Ahab's daughter, Athaliah. He married her and it further brought close ties between the northern and southern kingdoms. This wasn't good because the northern kingdom was just full of wickedness and idolatry. It wasn't good for Jehoshaphat and Joram to shack up with them and partake in all that. And even though, you know, Jehoshaphat, he remained a good king even through all this compromise and didn't really partake in any of their activities, he ends up causing his, his the people that reign in his stead to, to end up doing all that stuff. But Ozias is Uzziah or Azariah. See Second Chronicles 26.3, he was also a king of Judah. Now verse 9, And Ozias beget Jotham, and Jotham beget Achaz, and Achaz beget Ezekias. Jotham is Jotham of Second Kings 15.32, Achaz is Ahaz of Second Chronicles 28.1, Ezekias is Hezekiah. He was a good king in Judah that fell sick. Remember, he fell sick and prayed about it, and the Lord ended up adding 15 years to his life. You see, life and death is in the hand of the king, the real king. In Matthew 1.10, And Ezekias begat Manassas, and Manassas begat Ammon, and Ammon begat Josias. Manassas is the wicked king of Judah, Manasseh. Second Chronicles 33.1, read about him in that chapter. He was born to Hezekiah. The thing is, he was born to Hezekiah during those 15 extra years that the Lord added on to Hezekiah's life. So just think if Hezekiah would have went ahead and kicked the bucket, then there would have never been a wicked king, Manasseh. But who can bring such a clean thing as the Lord out of such an unclean thing? Only the Lord himself. Here is a list of some of the wicked things that Manasseh did, yet he's in the line of the Lord Jesus. He built altars for the host of heaven. He causes his children to pass through the fire. He observed times. He used enchantments. He used witchcrafts. He dealt with familiar spirits and wizards, and he made a carved image and set it in the house of the Lord. Manasseh ends up repenting, though, and getting right with the Lord, once again showing you that the Lord is merciful and will take anybody. He is the God of life. He is a God who begets. We are, me and you are begotten. Begotten through the gospel. We're, we're redeemed with precious blood. In Second Chronicles 33, 13, you read about how Manasseh repents, gets right with the Lord. That shows you that God will forgive anybody. The genealogy of Jesus Christ itself is a testimony of his grace, forgiveness, and ability to use anybody. It's not just a boring list of names. Then you got Ammon there. Talks about Ammon there. In verse 10, read about him, Second Chronicles 33, 21. Then you got Josias or Josiah. In 2 Chronicles 33, 25, in Matthew 1, 11, it says, And Josias beget Jeconias and his brethren about the time they were carried away to Babylon. So Jeconias is Jehoiakim or Jehoiachin or Jeconiah. He was reigning in Judah when King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came in and carried them to Babylon. Read this in 2 Kings 24, 8 through 17. But Jeconiah was so bad that the Lord removed the J-E from his name and just called him Coniah. He didn't want it to be similar to his name at all. You know, Jehovah. He didn't want Jeconiah having that name, so he took the J-E off. In Jeremiah twenty two twenty eight, it says, Is this man Coniah a despised broken idol? 
Is he a vessel wherein is no pleasure? Wherefore they cast out he and his seed, and are cast into a land which they know not. Jeremiah twenty two twenty nine. O earth, 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 hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, Write ye this man childless, a man that shall not prosper in his days. For no man of his seed shall prosper sitting upon the throne of David and ruling any more in Judah. So Coniah is, is cursed. No man of his seed shall prosper sitting on the throne. So this would mean that no man born in the line of Jeconias can prosper as king sitting on the throne. However, don't forget that Jesus Christ is not a physical descendant of Coniah. He is legal heir to the throne because of his adoptive father, Joseph. And since Joseph isn't his physical father, the curse bypasses the Lord Jesus. And this also proves the virgin birth because without the virgin birth, he would have had the curse on him as well. Remember also that Jesus' earthly mother Mary is in the line of David. Luke 3 gives you the genealogy of Jesus Christ through Mary. She's in the tribe of Judah. She's from Abraham. She's from David. Ab from Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David all, David, all the way through that line. Luke 20, see Luke 3, 23. And Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being as was supposed the son of Joseph. He wasn't the son of Joseph. He was as was supposed the son of Joseph, which was the son of Heli. Notice how it calls Joseph the son of Heli in Luke 3, 23. And it, but it calls him the son of Jacob in Matthew 1.16. This is because it's tracing the genealogy through the line of Joseph and Matthew, but through the line of Mary and Luke. Heli, or Heli, would be Joseph's father-in-law. So it's tracing it through the line of Mary. Either way you look at it, Jesus Christ, he's in the right line. He's in the line of David, and either way you look at it, he's... He doesn't have the curse on him. He's not a physical son of Coniah. You see, Jesus Christ is so qualified to be my king that he's overqualified. You can't get any more perfect. Many times someone won't give you a job if you know you're overqualified. Jesus is overqualified, but he's the only man for the job. He's the only one that could possibly do it. Nobody else has a running chance. He's our king. He is our king, any way you look at it. <coughs> In Matthew one twelve, and after they were brought to Babylon, Jeconias begat Salathiel. Salathiel begat Zerubbabel. See Zerubbabel, First Chronicles three nineteen, and Zerubbabel begat Abiad, and Abiad begat Eliakim, and Eliakim begat Azor, and Azor begat Sadok, and Sadok begat Achim, and Achim begat Eliad. And Eliad begat Eleazar, and Eleazar begat Mathen, and Mathen begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Notice it says, so and so begat so and so, until you get down to verse 16, and then it says, Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary. It says, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, and whom is singular. It simply just calls Joseph the husband of Mary and doesn't say, and Jacob beget Joseph and Joseph beget Jesus because Joseph is not Jesus' father. It says husband of Mary of whom was born Jesus and whom is singular, only referring to Mary. They didn't both have a part in it. Only Mary did. Joseph is just the adoptive father. And don't get it twisted. Mary isn't the mother of God. Jesus Christ is God, but he only used Mary to be born in the flesh. Jesus is fully God and fully man. Mary is only the mother of the flesh of Jesus. Jesus only used her to be born in the flesh down here. He was around way before that, from everlasting. Matthew 1.17, so all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. And from David until the carrying away to Babylon are 14 generations. And from the carrying away into Babylon unto Christ are 14 generations. So notice, 14 is 7 plus 7, right? So in verse 17, you have six sets of seven before Jesus Christ shows up. The people reading this gospel would have followed the last generation and would have been the seventh seven. 
So God uses the number seven. It's the, the number of completion. So we know Jesus is king because magnified words in his book. We know his king because of his his genealogy. Matthew's genealogy. We can trace it all the way back. The next we know is king because of his miracle birth. So magnified words in the book, Matthew's genealogy, and the miracle birth. Matthew 1.18, now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When as his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. And when it says the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, it just simply means the birth of Jesus Christ was this way. This is how it was. Mary was only a spouse to Joseph, like engaged. You see, they, they hadn't even come together sexually. So there is no way. No way that Joseph could have been Jesus Christ's father. The Holy Spirit himself tells you before they came together. You see, Joseph, there's no way, there's no, there's no way Joseph could have been Jesus Christ's father. It was a miracle birth. They were betrothed. They were contracted for future marriage. And in Deuteronomy 22, 24, it shows that a woman that's betrothed to a man could be called a wife even though they weren't actually married yet. So that's why it calls her his wife. That's why it talks about him, you know, putting her away. But they were really just engaged. They hadn't even come together yet. And during that time, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Notice that the Holy Spirit himself is telling you before they came together. Just so clear. Before they came together, she was found with child of what? The Holy Ghost. Not of Joseph, of the Holy Ghost. That's the virgin birth. Joseph wasn't his father. It's making it so plain. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. So Joseph, at this time, he's ignorant of what's going on. He didn't want to let this get out that she's with child because if she had committed adultery, then she would be made a public example. They would have taken her out and stoned her to death. And Joseph had legal right to do this for her committing adultery if she had done it. So, But he's going to put any. He's a just man, so he's going to put her away privily or privately. He could have been seeking retaliation or revenge, but he wasn't. It says, But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Notice that while he thought on these things. Since Joseph is a just man, I guarantee you he's practicing Philippians 4, 8 before it was written. Which says, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. He's not thinking, oh, I hate this woman. I'm going to go get her stoned to death and I'm going to retaliate and get revenge. Joseph is a just man because his thought life is where it needs to be. In 2 Corinthians 10.5, Paul says, Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Every thought should be kept in check. But the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream. Well, the angel Gabriel appeared to Zacharias in Luke 119. He was sent to Mary in Luke 126 through 27. But the angel of the Lord in Matthew 120 is most likely another pre-appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ throughout the Old Testament. You see the angel of the Lord appearing. For example, he appeared to Hagar in Genesis 16, 7 through 13. He appeared to Abraham in Genesis 22, 11 through 18. He appeared to Jacob in Genesis 32, 24 through 30. He appeared to Moses in Exodus 3, 2 through 22, to Balaam in Numbers 22, 22 through 35, to Joshua in Joshua 5, 13 through 15. He appeared to Israel in Judges 2, 1 through 5. He appeared to Gideon in Judges 6, 11 through 24. He appeared to Samson's parents in Judges 13, 2 through 23. 
and he appeared in the fiery furnace back there in Daniel 3, 24 through 23. That's just a few places that the angel of the Lord appeared, a pre-appearance of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is called the angel of God. In Galatians 4, 14, it says, And my temptation, which was in my flesh, you despised not nor rejected, but received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. Jesus is the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord means an, like an appearance of the Lord. The angel of the Lord is a pre-appearance of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is how God appears visibly to us. In John 14, 9, it says, And Jesus saith unto him, I have been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Jesus is how the Lord appears visibly to us. But it says in Matthew one twenty one, And shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. That's what the angel tells Joseph. So she shall bring forth a son. This is the only begotten son of John 3.16. He is the son of the highest in Luke one thirty two. He's the firstborn in Romans 8.29. You see, Jesus Christ has two natures. He's got the nature of man that he got from Mary, and he's got the nature of God from the Father. Jesus Christ is my king because of his miracle birth, because of his, because Matthew's genealogy proves it, because of his magnified words that he wrote in his book showing us, and next because of his marvelous name. He's king. Matthew one twenty one says, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. If they 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 you see they were instructed on what to call him. And if you want a good name, then follow instructions from the Word of God, just like Joseph and Mary. Those are good names. You still know of people named Joseph and Mary today. In Proverbs 22, 1, it says, A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches, and loving favor rather than silver and gold. You see, Jesus' name is a good name. His name itself proves that he's God. Jesus means Jehovah saves, or God is salvation. In Matthew one twenty three, he's called Emmanuel, and that means God with us. His name itself proves who he is. It says in Philippians 2, 9, and 10, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth, and things under the earth. At the name of Jesus every knee will bow. They didn't know his name in the Old Testament. <laughs> It was a secret in Judges 13, 18, but now you can have faith in his name. See Acts 3, 16. And there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. In Acts 4, 12, Jesus Christ has seven names before he's even born. The son of David in Matthew 1, 1. The son of Abraham in Matthew 1, 1. Jesus in Matthew 1, 21. Emmanuel in Matthew 1, 23. The Son of the Highest in Luke one thirty two, the Son of God in Luke one thirty five, and Christ in Matthew one sixteen. Someone's ears may perk up when they when you say the name of their loved one or their favorite athlete or celebrity, but as a Christian your ears should perk up when you hear his marvelous name. In Proverbs thirty and verse four it says, What is his name? What's the Lord's name and what is his son's name? If thou canst tell, he's got a marvelous name. And next, I know he's my king because he is a merciful savior. In Matthew one twenty one, it says, And shall, she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. He is a king that would lay down his life for his people instead of having his people lay down their life for him. He doesn't need you to lay down his life for him. He doesn't. You couldn't pay for his sins, and he doesn't have any sins. Now, we lay down our life for him. We lose our life for him. Because we love him and that appreciation. But he's the one that really had to lay down his life. So that we could even have a chance to be saved. It says for he shall save his people from their sins. Now his people here is Israel. However me and you got in on it eventually. Jesus Christ is completely sinless. This is the only way he could save us from our sins. And it says it very plainly in the scriptures in 2 Corinthians 5.21. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew 
no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. In 1 Peter 2.21, it says, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example, that ye should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was God found in his mouth. Hebrews 4.15, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Hebrews 7.25, Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. For such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. He's a merciful Savior. He can be our Savior because he's sinless. And I know he's my king because he's a merciful Savior and because he's because of the messianic prophecies that he fulfilled. In Matthew one twenty two, it says, And all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which is spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, You see, no matter what happens, when anybody says what people try to change, all the prophecies that God has laid out will come to pass. Jesus Christ fulfilled so many prophecies that there is no way he could be a phony or just some type of coincidence. You see, the Bible says we have a more sure word of prophecy. And all the prophecies in the Bible are sure. They're going to come to pass. And this one in Matthew specifically has to do with the virgin birth. And Matthew one twenty three says, Behold, a virgin shall be with child. And this, this is just one of the many fulfilled prophecies that Jesus fulfilled at his first coming. And it says, And shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Which being interpreted is God with us. And that fulfilled the prophecy back in Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. Once again, the Lord's name has to do with his deity. Jesus Christ is God with us. And see, that's a messianic prophecy fulfilled. And there are seven women in the Bible that picture Mary's miracle birth. You have Sarah in Genesis 11.30, Rebecca in Genesis 25.21. You got Rachel in Genesis 29.31. You got Manoah's wife in Judges 13.2. You got Hannah in 1 Samuel 1.2. You got the Shunammite woman in 2 Kings 4.14. And you got Elizabeth in Luke 1.7. And next... I know he's my king because he is the maker manifested in the flesh. Jesus is my king because he's the only one who would have left the riches of the third heaven to be manifested in the flesh and die for my sins. He's God with us. Matthew one twenty three. As I said, Mary is not the mother of God. She's simply the way by the which the Lord used to come down to man in the flesh. It says in 2 Corinthians 8 9, Though he was rich... Yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. You see, what king would come down to live as a servant and humble himself to the death of the cross? Only God. 1 Timothy 3.16 shows you that God was manifest in the flesh. Philippians 2.5 says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. In Matthew uh, one twenty four, Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife. See, Joseph would be a Bible believer today. He believed the words that were spoken to him by the Lord and didn't try to change them. He was raised from sleep and did what God told him to do, just like you should do. Maybe you are in a spiritual sleep right now. You need to wake up and do what God wants you to do. It's high time to awake out of sleep, as it says in Romans thirteen eleven. But Joseph, being raised from sleep, as the angel of the Lord had bidden to him, had took unto him his wife, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. This is your maker manifested in the flesh. Joseph waited before he would know his wife, so that there was no doubt that Joseph wasn't the father, they hadn't even came together until after Jesus Christ was born. However, after the Lord was born, they did come together. You see, contrary to what many teach, Mary didn't stay a virgin forever. If she did, then she defrauded Joseph 
and left him to burn in his lust their entire marriage, which would have broke one of God's commands of 1 Corinthians 7, 5. Not to mention Jesus Christ has brothers and sisters, as it talks about in Psalm 69, 8 and Mark 6, 3 and Galatians 1, 19. But she was a virgin. And Job 15, 14 says, What is man that he should be clean? And he that which is born of a woman, that he should be righteous. Jesus Christ is the only one born of a woman who wasn't born with a sin nature. He was born clean and righteous. Me and you are not born clean or righteous. We must be born again. And you get born again when you come to the Lord Jesus Christ as a guilty sinner and put your trust in him and what he did on the cross to pay for your sins. Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins he was buried and resurrected. He shed his blood for you on the cross. And if you want to be born again and have a birth that's where you're born clean and righteous, then you come to him as a guilty sinner. Put your trust in him and what he did for you on the cross to pay for your sins. And then you can be born again. But I just want to do something different. If you want these notes, come to the website, hensleybiblebeliever.com. You'll find the notes here. And I want to get back to being more active with the email. If you got any questions, it's hensleybiblebeliever at gmail.com. I'm going to try to do at least one or two of these a week. So if you got any questions about this, just send me an email. I'll try to answer your questions about the chapter. Hensley Bible Believer at gmail.com.